So thank you. It's a huge pleasure to be here in, its beautiful, in this beautiful city and at IMPA. It's been a while, and each time I come here, I enjoy it enormously. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a recent joint project with Erman Cinelli and Basha Gurel and Marco Mazzucchelli. And this is about a peculiar phenomenon in dynamics, which kind of I've just realized that it's probably an interesting thing by itself, and it manifests itself in a variety of ways. Namely, whenever you have something like, um, say, a hyperbolic orbit, it actually affects dynamics, the global dynamics of a Hamiltonian system in a in a non-localized way. So this is different from um, things like the um, dynamics of uh, uniformly or non-uniformly hyperbolic systems or partial hyperbolicity uh, because ultimately it's not um, confined to the hyperbolic set, it's not confined to its neighborhood, but it's kind of spread all over the dynamical system. There are a couple of, just to give a couple of ex uh, examples not so directly related to, the, uh, uh, to this talk. One is that whenever you have a hyperbolic periodic orbits, then C infinity generically you will have a, sorry, not right. Then C1 generically, uh, you will have a horseshoe and therefore you will have some positive entropy, infinitely many periodic orbits, etc. So in, as stated, this is a result of uh, Sha and Hayashi. And actually in dimension two, uh, this is true C infinity uh, generically. This is a very recent, uh, probably deeper theorem of, um, of local West and Sambarina. Actually, kind of just to say a word about it, when we go back to the C1 case and in O dimension, this is actually a closing glamour type of result. What you need to do, the way you do it, it's enough to create one intersection of the stable and unstable manifold, not necessarily transverse. And then once you have one intersection, it's easy to make it transverse. So that's a, a, a kind of closing glamour result. And so in dimension two then, it naturally leads to a question, can we reprove, or can one reprove the C infinity generic case by sort of using symplectic method? So uh, methods, this is kind of one class of um, examples where local dynamics, uh, local, just essentially one hyperbolic periodic orbit affects global dynamics. The second example is what Bashak is going to talk about today, and this is the uh, fact that when you have one or a sufficient number of hyperbolic periodic uh, points, you necessarily get a lower bound on the spectral norm on the iterations. So this is a very different type of phenomenon, but it is the same um, in kind of conceptually, it's a very similar thing when um, th there is this input from um, hyperbolic periodic points to global dynamics. And maybe like a, um, a remark is that actually, um, in many cases, with very few exceptions, uh, a Hamiltonian dynamical system has infinitely many 
hyperbolic points see infinity generically. This is a theorem of Arnaud. And it's, it's essentially kind of a variant of uh, uh, berhoff moser theorem. So it follows from the proof of the um, berhoff moser theorem. So I'm going to talk about the extension to rep flows of two uh, results which are kind of well known and understood for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So the first uh, of this is a theorem, quite old theorem with Bashak. And it says that whenever we have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of a projective space with a hyperbolic point, let me say fixed point, does not matter, can be periodic. Then there are infinitely many periodic points. So at this moment, this result is mainly of, a, of historical interest. Uh, there is a recent theorem of Igor Shiluhin, which uh, says that whenever you have more than n plus one, periodic points, you necessarily have infinitely many periodic points. Or so if you have more than n CP1, two, uh, more than n plus one, yeah, more than n plus one uh, fixed points, then under actually very minor non-degeneracy assumptions, you have infinitely many periodic points, and you can think of this as a high, dim uh, high dimensional analog of uh, the celebrated theorem of Frank's um, kind of uh, stating the same or uh, asserting the same thing uh, for the sphere for CP1. So um, the proof is quite different from our original argument, but uh, I think the original, the, this theorem for hyperbolic points, it actually has two uh, components which are still of some interest. One of them is that um, uh, the proof is based on a crossing energy bound, which actually plays a central role in some uh, other results, our results on entropy and in this talk too. And the second point is that one can look at the whole picture here from a different perspective, and this is due to Bashak. Namely, rather than just counting the number of points, you can look at a, uh, at a particular periodic point and just uh, ask yourself if, it, if it's unnecessary, if it looks out of place, if it's something a, a map could do without. For instance, a map of... Um, CPN, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN, does not have to have hyperbolic points. And whenever you have an unnecessary point, whenever you have a point which looks wrong, uh, there must be infinitely many periodic points. By the same token, here is a conjecture that if you have a, uh, a periodic point which is degenerate, and this is something that does not have to exist, you necessarily have infinitely many periodic points. And this perspective um, applies to many other situations. You can take a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of some other manifold, and if it has a non-contractable periodic orbit, 
then it necessarily has infinitely many non-contractable periodic orbits. So there are results along this line, starting with uh, Bashak and then Marta Batoria and Arita and Sugimoto, and more recently, Local Ves and Tal and Sambarina. So um, basically, there is yet a different uh, perspective here. So this is the first result we want to generalize to rep flows, so let's call it theorem one. Theorem two is more recent. This is also with Bashak 2018. And it says this, CP. Let's take a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN, and I want it to be a pseudo rotation. Then, no fixed point is isolated as an invariant. Set. So there are several definitions of pseudo rotations, but for our purposes here, the, uh, it's easy to adopt the simplest one and say that phi has as few periodic point, points or as few fixed po as few periodic points as possible. So. For our purposes, this is just that the number of periodic points of phi is as small as possible, which by Arnold's conjecture make it n plus one. So now what does this mean and why this is? This is interesting. So we can take, let's say we have a map, we can have a fixed point of this map, and we say it's isolated or locally maximal as an invariant set if for any initial condition, no matters, you probably cannot see it blue, so for any initial condition, no matter how close it is to x, the trajectory through this initial condition eventually leaves a neighborhood of X. So there are no sets contained in the neighborhood of X. Something like that doesn't happen. And an example of a locally maximal um, fixed points is a hyperbolic so this theorem is a high dimensional variant of so this is a generalization to high dimension of a uh, similar result of local vas and your cause and then with a different from proof by franks for s2 equal to cpn now, why is it interesting and why is it uh, in a way surprising? So, um, so the rotations of uh, CPN or even S2 can have very interesting dynamics. So, uh, an old construction of sorry. a loss of N cut talk 
going back to 70, says that there exist pseudo rotations of S2 with exactly three invariant, with exactly three ergodic measures. And once you have exactly three ergodic measures, you know what they are. There are two fixed points. And then there must be a third measure, and this is the uh, symplectic form. So the way these things look like there are two fixed points, and then it's ergodic. And it's uniquely ergodic on the complement of these two points. So there are lots of dense orbits. Actually, for the absolute majority of points in the interior of that sphere outside the poles, the orbit will be dense. However, uh, but, and you would actually expect that every orbit is dense. After all, when you have a compact manifold, uh, unique ergodicity implies that uh, the map is minimal, so every orbit is dense. Here, unfortunately, it's, oh, here it's not quite uniquely ergodic because of these two points, and once, or once you remove these two points, it's not quite compact. So you cannot literally apply that basic fact, but still the expectation is that every orbit should be dense. And moreover, assume it's not, assume there is an invariant set somewhere here, then we can try to take a point in this invariant set and associate to it a measure, right? There is a general construction, uh, what is it called? krylov bogolubov uh, theorem, which tells you how to start with a point and get out of it an invariant measure. So you will be getting some measure. And this measure, because uh, the orbit is confined to the neighborhood, cannot be the area form. So this, this measure then turns out to be just the delta measure associ associated with the pole. That's the only way it can be for the pole not to be locally maximal and the uh, uh, map to have only three ergodic measures. So, but, uh, this is kind of a very interesting difference, uh, fundamental difference between invariant measures and invariant set. You have very few invariant uh, measures, but a lot of invariant sets. So in any event, from this perspective, uh, the result of local West on your cause uh, is, was quite surprising. And there is a, an extension of this, uh, of the anosov katok conjugation method to high dimensions in the Hamiltonian setting by Leroux and C. Fidini. So there are a lot of pseudo rotations with interesting dynamics and uh, no fixed point isolated as, a, uh, as an invariant set. So are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, what's the statement of the Leroux statement? So uh, the statement of Leroux Silfadini is very much like uh, the anosov talk. Uh, let me do it for CPN. Uh, given so, so for a CPN, there exists a Hamiltonian pseudo rotation with exactly, and now you should ask actually what this uh, three for S2 stands for, whether it is like uh, N plus 
what the two is, and I think in their, is, uh, in their case it is n plus two. N plus one fixed points plus the uh, volume form. And they have a similar construction for um, photoric, photoric manifolds, and I don't remember what the minimum. Is it L plus? So, so other, other uh, strata do not contribute. So you, uh, it's, it's not obvious what the minimal number is. Uh, and I think so it's just the minimal strata, the points, and the, the, the maximal strata, the whole manifold. So our goal was in this project to generalize this uh, two results to um, rep flows. And there are some interesting new things happening here, as you kind of all know, when you start working with rep flows, things get uh, more involved. So here is the setting. So we have a sphere with a contact form in R2N, we should really think of it as the boundary of a star-shaped domain. And what we want from it we is, so uh, this is the contact form here, what we want is dynamical convexity. And we do not require any non-degeneracy. The dynamical convexity in this case is that for every closed rep orbit, the Conley-Zender index of that orbit is at least n plus one. And because we don't require non-degeneracy, the Conley-Zender index here is the lower semi-continuous extension of the Conley-Zender index. It appears that actually this is usually the right type of index to work with without degeneracy. So this is the condition strictly weaker than geometric convexity. It's very easy to see that convexity implies dynamical convexity. This is, the, the whole notion is due to Hopper, Wysotsky, and Zender uh, from some probably 20 years ago plus, and this implication is virtually obvious, but the non-trivial point, uh, as a side remark, is that the converse is true, and this is Chides. And it my quite recently. So here is then the first theorem. So let's require alpha to be dynamically convex, plus it has a hyperbolic periodic orbit, z, then there are infinitely many closed rep orbits. So, in fact, the dynamical convexity condition here is much, what you need is much weaker as the dynamical convexity requirement stated here. What would be sufficient to assume is that the Conley-Zender index for every orbit is at least three. And one more thing 
is that the difference between the Kornizander index and the algebraic uh, multiplicity of one is at least two. So, for instance, in the non-degenerate case, it would be enough to get the lower bound uh, three here. So, this is true for every x. So this is kind of theorem one. I have two theorem ones, right? Uh, let's call this guys primes. Um, yes, that's true. So, yeah. The mean index of the hyperbolic orbit has to be positive. That's the. What's your definition of hyperbolic orbit? Uh, all eigenvalues of the return map are off uh, the unit circle. There are no what are they, elliptic eigenvalues. That's, that's kind of the standard definition. It doesn't have to, I don't care about the signs, if, if that's your question. Uh-huh. Can you relax into just requiring that the orbit is not isolated? I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Yes, yes and no. So now I prefer to treat these two theorems as uh, different results even though one of them, even though they're very really related. So theorem two. Um, so uh, both of these theorems, this is uh, Cinelli and uh, G squared and Marca. So and this is Cinelli, G squared and Marca. So let's say the rep flow is a um, rep pseudo rotation. And by that, I simply mean that it has uh, exactly n plus one closed rep orbits. So uh, three and yeah, n plus one is correct. Uh, then unfortunately I need dynamical convexity and, okay, I need dynamical convexity and unfortunately I need non-degeneracy. So, and then no closed rep orbit is locally maximal. So this answers your question that yes, I can, but then I need to ask for slightly more. So this theorem is almost a generalization of theorem one because, um, uh, because hyperbolic uh, orbits are locally maximal, but I need to ask for um, uh, for, uh, for, for non-degeneracy and really a strong form of dynamical convexity. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Any Sorry, 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 sorry. That's... I think I'm still thinking of CPN rather than CPN minus one. Thank you. So, okay, I'll get to this. Uh, so there is, unfortunately, in contrast with um, CPN, we know much less. So there is a 
just talking about this and there are immediately several questions here. What is N? So hypothetically, N is the uh, minimal possible number of close, simple closed trap orbits. This, uh, in the case of dynamical convexity, this is the, um, and in, the, in this case, dynamically convex and non-degenerate, this is known. I think this is uh, long and due, about 20 years ago. Um, without, and then actually there have been a whole uh, series of refinements of that result, for instance, without non-degeneracy. And I think in general is not known, but something on the scale of N over two is known, and there have been a series of works here starting uh, with, again, Long and Zhu, and then uh, uh, in the West by Makarini um, uh, uh, and Obro uh, and Bashak. So uh, this is like one uh, big subject here. Hypothetically, of course, once you have more than n, you got to have infinitely many. So the, uh, there should be a variant of um, Frank's theorem in this case, but again, this is probably very far from known, and if you want to think from this perspective, this is kind of a step in that, in that direction. So Locally maximal is here, which means that, okay, uh, no, no invariant sets other than the orbit itself in a neighborhood of X. So every trajectory starting close to X, but not on X, eventually escapes a neighborhood either in positive time or negative time. So there are no invariant sets contained in a neighborhood. And again, sort of uh, this two, this condition is that exactly, and this is, the flow is a rep, Pseudo rotation and rep pseudo rotations can also have a very non trivial dynamics. So the first examples say ergodic rep pseudo rotations are due to Anosov 1973 and more recently. In dimension three, they've been reconstructed by um, Albers and uh, Geiges and Zemich. But in some sense, this is much simpler than the Hamiltonian case. You can take an ellipsoid, and there are rep pseudo rotations which are C infinity close to this ellipsoid in which are ergodic. I don't know about the number of. Uh, if, if Katok uh, constructs them with a, I don't remember whether he gets a finite number of invariant measures, but I'm fairly confident that one can do that too by the same method. So these are the um, two results I want to... Uh, All dimensions. Just any, it's, it's an incredibly, unfortunately that paper is available only in, in, uh, in Russian, but this is one of those brilliant papers by Katok. Uh, it's 1973 and somehow he anticipates many things that uh, were yet to happen. It is just Katok. Yeah, oh, 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 pardon me. Misattributed, this is It's probably one of the last papers he wrote in Russian. Uh -huh. Do you know something about the mean indices in these orbits? 
Oh, <coughs> you mean in cat <coughs> in catox construction? So, so this is like a different, uh, a different question. So assume you have n orbits and exactly n. So, so, so the question would be, uh, assume these three conditions. Uh, what can you tell about the orbits? Does it look like an ellipsoid, say? Uh, a number of things are known about it. Uh, Basha has something, uh, Basha and I have something, but I, I don't remember how conclusive these things are. Uh, Leonardo may have something. Uh, it's, it's actually a messy thing. Already for CPN in a similar situation, it's a messy thing. Uh, compared to my point, you has, we have a result about this dimension field. Right? We have precise Jupiter orbits. Then you have something essentially like I think you better talk about this. So, yeah, uh, I, th I think Leonardo would be the right question, too. So, I need three theories to at least uh, briefly outline the idea <coughs> of the book. So, the first theorem is. by my former student, Sean, and actually it's more like Iria than us. And it says this, assume I have a Louisville domain and I have its contact boundary, and let's see the symplectic homology, non-equivalent symplectic homology of this Louisville domain, and I prefer to think of it as a function of the contact form, is zero. Then, using modern terminology, I would say that there is an a priori bound on the barcode of alpha. The way we stated it back then is this. There exists a constant which depends only on the uh, form alpha, such that for any interval r, i in r, the natural quotient map of the filtering homology for the interval i to the homology of the shifted interval i plus c so I'm taking the interval i and moving it to the right by this constant c, so that this quotient inclusion map is zero. So, for instance, if I take the interval i to be the entire axis r, here I have R, here I have R plus C, which is again R. I have the identity map, and the identity map is zero, meaning the homology itself is zero. This is the left-hand side. So in fact, it's if and only if, but as I said, this inclusion is obvious. This part is obvious. So the interesting direction is this. It's an easier. So that's one ingredient. And of course, it's well known that whenever, uh, so here is an example. If the Louisville domain is displaceable in its symplectic completion, then the symplectic homology is zero. I think for the sphere, it's by, it's due to Peter Bohr, then um, there is a, um, 
indirect proof by Chilibak and Fraunfelder and Oanche um, using Rabinovitz floor homology. There is a direct proof by Sean and myself, and there is also a direct proof by Sugimoto. So it's kind of usually when you have a nearly trivial result, it's kind of been proved many times. So that's one of uh, examples. This minimal C is the non-equivalent symplectic capacity. For instance, um, uh, um, you can take as okay, you can take as C the um, displacement energy when it is displaceable. But uh, in general, this is kind of the non-equivalent symplectic capacity of W in, in this. The second, the second ingredient we need is I should probably attribute to Bashak and myself as I'm going in the form I'm going to state it. And also to Wong and Zhu. Although they stated it differently. So just to give you a flavor of this what this theorem uh, says. It's kind of awkward to see, just, just an example. This is actually a result from symplectic linear algebra. So let's start with a linear symplectic map, and maybe I want I don't want an, uh, an element of SP to M, but I want an uh, element of the universal covering of that group so that um, the condensatory index is well defined. And I want the mean index of that map to be positive. So the question is, Let's look at the sequence of the condensatory indices of the iterates of that linear map. How does it behave? Is there any sort of periodicity property to this uh, sequence? Is there any, any, any pattern? And it turns out that yes. So I'm going to state it <coughs> now in a somewhat imprecise for. So there exists, no, for any positive integer zero, and for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a sequence kj going to infinity, and another sequence dj going to infinity, such that for any integer between 0 and n, the condensatory index of phi to the ki plus l is equal to dj uh, plus the condensatory index of phi to the l. This is the first condition. I'm going to 
explain what it means. And the second condition is that D is nearly the in uh, the mean index of this up to an epsilon there. So let's try to see what it really says. So what I'm doing is this. This is the axis on which I'm going to mark the condensed indices. This is the phi to the zero. Here I have the index of phi. Here I have the index of phi squared. Here I have the index of phi inverse up to n. So I'm looking at this finite interval. And then what this theorem says, so I have a sequence of numbers. Then what this theorem says is that as I start iterating phi, this sequence will eventually repeat itself infinitely many times. So here I will have phi to the kj and when I take this interval and move it to the right so that it's centered at one of these iterates, the values of indices, well, they cannot be quite the same because they must grow because the mean index is zero. But they are the same up to a shift which depends only on uh, j. And then again, I can move it sufficiently far to the right so that this sequence will repeat itself again up to some other shift, and so on. So in fact, if I could, if I replace the sequence by the derivatives of that sequence, you know, the difference between um, the, uh, uh, between the H2 um, indices, then uh, the, this interval would literally repeat itself infinitely many times. So there is a certain recurrence property to it. And as stated, it is a consequence of, um, of the Kronecker theorem. And uh, there is a non-degenerate variant of it. And uh, uh, DJ, this is one of these guys. So, uh, whenever I move it to the right, I have to uh, shift all these indices here by some constant. And this constant is, it is an integer, but other than that, it's nearly equal to the mean index. And there is a similar uh, thing. Uh, theorem for actually for several, for any finite number of um, linear maps. So this is, this is ultimately something that goes back to the uh, early 2000 to Long and Zhu. Uh, in this form, it's Bashak and I. And yes. Uh, so epsilon is given. So uh, you give me an n and this error, and I find two sequences, the sequence of iterations, 
and the sequence of shifts such that uh, dj is the shift and dj is nearly equal to the mean index of these guys. This is the mean index of the iterate. It's the mean index of the iterate. So uh, the mean I cannot define the mean index, but the mean index is the linear rate of growth. So mu of phi is equal to the limit as k goes to infinity of mu of phi to the k over k. So this is the linear rate of growth. And another perspective on the mean index is that the deviation between the mean index and the index is at least, is at most half of the dimension. So this condition forces the shift they have to be there. And in addition, the, uh, what the theorem says, they are nearly equal to the uh, uh, mean index. So this is the second ingredient. And the third ingredient, which I you just stated, which is a kind of new development here. All this, all this part we have known for a while is the energy crossing theory. I'll go over time by a couple of minutes. So let me first say what the energy crossing theory uh, is in the Hamiltonian case. Let's take X. This is a periodic order. Of each, and I want it to be locally maximum. So it's isolated as, a, uh, as an invariant set. And let's, I'm going to think of it as, uh, as it, uh, uh, if it is the fixed point of the flow. Let's look at the floor trajectories, which are asymptotic to X and also to the k, to the case iterate of x. Then there exists a constant called c infinity, such that the energy of a flow trajectory asymptotic to x to the k is bounded from below by c infinity. And the key point here is that this constant is independent of k. If it were for an individual k, this would be essentially a consequence of whatever uh, form of Gromov compactness you want to use. Say in the non-degenerate case, there are only finitely many orbits. So, um, of course, uh, so, so you have essentially a finite number, of, uh, finite collection of numbers here. Yes? X is locally maximum. And U has to be asymptotic to it, so U of plus minus infinity. So U of S T goes to X of X K of T as S goes to. No, it's actually uh, I'm I'm asking for uh, for too much. Uh, my real assumption is you give me a neighborhood of X to the K, then starting with some S, the uh, you will be entirely contained in this neighborhood. So th this would be enough, but, uh, but I don't need that much. 
No, just my name. And, uh, and the other end, something different from, uh, no, and, 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 and the other end can be anything. Uh, it can, yeah, that's the only exception. It cannot be constant. But something like this, Each is some Hamiltonian. I'm stating the Hamiltonian version of it. Perhaps you write the U is a fluor cylinder. So it should fill the U is a fluor cylinder. So, and this I would attribute to one, and there is a similar statement for. I want to uh, comment on it. First of all, it's not even clear what I mean. There is a similar. I mean, uh, when we look at floor trajectories for a Hamiltonian H, there is much more than H involved in here. There is a um, whole setup, the almost complex structure. When I talk about rep flows and do symplectic homology, there is much more in, uh, involved to it. I need to take an admissible Hamiltonian, an almost complex structure, etc., etc. So um, once you put this all in the background, there is a similar state. And when why this theorem then is not a consequence of the result for uh, Hamiltonian flows is that once I take an admissible Hamiltonian then and look at the periodic orbit corresponding to a closed rep orbit, it's no longer isolated. It's no longer isolated as an invariant set. There will be a whole family of so you cannot directly take this result and apply uh, it in the rep case. And actually to say, I must say that it's something which has been a total uh, puzzle for us for many years. So it's, it took us, uh, it's been probably at least five years on our mind till Irman uh, proved something like that. There are a couple of closely related recent results along this line, which I, uh, which I want to mention. There is a uh, similar theorem for, uh, um, for geodesic flow. So uh, crossing energy for geodesic flows, which is proved by a completely and there is a very recent work, I don't know uh, as it's still work in progress have been already uh, posted by uh, Rahil Prasad which states a uh, crossing energy theorem for holomorphic curves which is probably in the long run the right way to do it. Uh, kind of, at least for holomorphic curves, it's, so, it's very easy to say you take a holomorphic curve in the simplicitization, it's asymptotic to a locally maximal orbit at uh, one of the ends, and then the energy of that holomorphic curve is bounded away from zero by a constant independent 
of the uh, iteration. Uh, the shortcoming is that ultimately you need to take uh, this theorem and plug it into some kind of floor theory. And there is no, uh, not yet ready to use floor theory to plug it here. So there are, there are kind of trade-offs here. Uh, yes? So, uh, okay, <coughs> that, that's, that's complicated. You take an admissible Hamiltonian. So this is your uh, domain. Uh, your you will domain, you take a Hamiltonian, which is identically zero on that domain. It's convenient. And then it, so this is the part M cross C1 infinity. And then it's convex, and then it's linear. And you look at the periodic orbit of kh corresponding to x to the k. And you look at floor trajectories asymptotic to that guy on either end. And again, the, uh, what I, the problem that arises here, it's no longer isolated. So that's literally. So I'm over time by more than I promised, so let me stop here.